Good evening, my name is Brian Bird. I have the honor of serving as the City Councilman District 3 in Fort Worth. This is our uh, town hall meeting to talk about what's going on in the city, particularly as we approach budget season uh, right now. Uh, one of my great honors in life is to serve as your representative to this city on the City Council. Uh, this is the city that I grew up in. Uh, we've raised our kids in, uh, we've built our businesses here, and uh, we just love Fort Worth, and I know that you do too. This is a chance for you to hear from the folks that uh, run the city, uh, to provide our police and fire, the streets and roads, uh, libraries, uh, parks, all the things that we rely on uh, for our city government to provide. And one of the reasons that I tell people uh, that I enjoy being on council so much is that I get to work with some really wonderful people who are highly skilled uh, and we just, we work really hard but we also enjoy uh, what we're doing. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll have a few guests on. I'm going to ask some questions. You're able, I think, in some way or another to call in and ask a question or send us an email, that sort of thing. We'll try to get to all the questions uh, that we can and uh, 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 hopefully you'll get yours answered uh, if you ask it. So our first guest this evening is the city manager of Fort Worth, Mr. David Cook. And uh, you know, maybe if, if, if you've never met David, it'd be good if he would just kind of tell us a little bit, you know, David, how long have you been the city manager? Where are you from? That sort of thing. Very good. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's also a pleasure working with you. Uh, so a little background, so I've been with the city now six years. Uh, so I came in June of 2014. I'd spent a uh, previous career in North Carolina working in city county government in the private sector and had the great fortune of uh, being able to come to Fort Worth to be city manager back in 2014. Uh, I will say that it's been a challenging year in 2020 and you know, we may talk about some of that with COVID and the things going on around the country and here in Fort Worth as well. Uh, but to me, there's no greater privilege than to work with the public, to serve the people, and uh, make sure we leave Fort Worth better than we found it. That's great. I love that. Thanks for that. Well, we're glad that you're here. All right. I've been knocking on doors all, the last month, and I can tell you the number one thing that people want to talk about is what's going to happen to my property tax rate. Now, we're, so, we're, we're about to set it, right? And closing in two weeks from now. Two weeks right. from now, right. Council's going to vote on it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think about 25% of yours and mine, everybody's watching, property tax bill pays for a good portion of what the city does. Tell us about what, what the property tax rate for that portion of the bill is going to do. Okay, let's jump into that because... Uh, I think everybody wants to know about the property tax rate, but really what they want to know is are they going to end up paying more in taxes or less in taxes or the same amount. Very good, very good. And there's two parts of that equation. One is the value of the property, and you, everybody has received by now something from the Tarrant Appraisal District or one of the other appraisal districts that Fort Worth, it, you know, we're now in, what, five counties, mm -hmm. so we get... Mm -hmm. We have citizens in a number of different counties that get these tax bills. But anyway, so you have a value of your home or whatever, and then you're going to multiply that times the tax rate. So if your values go up a little bit and the tax rate comes down, then you might pay the same amount or less. If the value goes up and the tax rate stays the same, even though the tax rate didn't increase, you might pay more in property taxes. Sure. Right? Yeah. And the converse could be true if the value goes down, tax rate stays the same, then you'll pay less in property taxes. Yeah, yeah. The property tax rate, which the council is responsible to set, will remain the same in next year's uh, recommended budget. So for fiscal year 21, we're currently in fiscal year 20, the tax rate is recommended to stay the same. And there's a few reasons for that. Well, first, let me go back. Uh, I hope the public recognizes that the council has reduced the property tax rate each of the last four years to it almost 11 cents or somewhere 11 or 12 cents. And so that's a tremendous benefit to the citizens over time. And I also think it was great because it makes us more competitive from a property tax rate. 
I believe, and I think the council did too, that our property tax rate was too high, and there was a goal to reduce it over time, and we've been doing that. But the property tax rate for next year is recommended to stay the same. Part of that is we've seen the lowest increase in values. So of all the valued property in Fort Worth, taxable value, it grew by less than one half of 1%. We haven't seen that in six to eight years. Mm. And so when the values actually don't go up, right, we needed to generate uh, the same amount of property tax revenue year over year and the new uh, growth that goes with that. But the property tax rate, bottom line is, property tax rate stays the same next year. Okay, gotcha. So chances are then a homeowner like myself would see an increase, but a very small increase overall in the amount of taxes uh, that I'm going to pay on the city portion of my property tax bill. Is that, is that a fair statement? So I think it would, let me generalize it, because yeah. you can't, there's no such thing as an average, right? Nobody's an average. If you, if your value went up about 3%, right, your tax rate, your tax bill is going to go up about 3%, yeah. because the rate's going to stay the same. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right, thanks for that. Okay. So that's how at least some of our budget gets paid for. The rest of it, good portion of it, is through sales tax and some other things. Give us a few highlights in this coming year's budget, if you don't mind. Sure. Let me start with the real big, big picture, because each year we spend about $1.8 billion. The city of Fort Worth is a huge enterprise. And a lot of that relates to what we call the enterprise funds. And th these are really different business operations. Uh, we're responsible for three general aviation airports. We're responsible for a regional water and sewer system that serves more than the city of Fort Worth. Uh, we have a stormwater utility. <clears throat> we run and operate a landfill. So when you think about all the things that the city does, you know, people focus on did you pick up my garbage, police, fire, and maintain the streets, which we do out of our general fund, and that's, only, that's about $720 million, so it's still a substantial enterprise. But our total enterprise is much bigger, and it's $1.8 billion. People see those uh, costs through water and sewer rates. Those aren't going up either. Uh, they see it through the stormwater bill, which is on, um, again, the water bill but there's a stormwater fee, there's an environmental fee, the environmental fee is not going up, stormwater fee is not going up. So we've really tried to maintain the budget at really current levels. And there's, I can get into that in more detail. Uh, COVID hurt us this year a little bit and when we had to cut back some operations, we've had to downsize the workforce. Uh, but I think next year will be more difficult and so keeping the tax rate the same, keeping water and sewer rates the same, keeping the environmental fees the same is part of a longer, I think, budget issue that will carry over multiple fiscal years. So we need to be thinking about not just next year's recommended budget, but the year after that, and I think the year after that. So we're trying to uh, hunker down might be the right phrase in some of this? Well, we are in Fort Worth, Texas. I think hunker down works so, great. So yeah. Hunker down on this budget is uh, really one of the things that we're currently doing. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, we're keeping the tax rate the same. And so what I think we're able to say is we're able to meet our commitments. So we're still implementing the 2018 bond program, the 2014 yeah. bond program. We're still growing at 15 to 20,000 people a year. So we're yeah. still a growing city. So we still have to be able to invest in infrastructure and maintain the infrastructure that we build. Uh, so we're keeping our level of effort at the same, when, when we say keeping the tax rate the same, our level of effort's keeping um, track too. And so we're trying yep. to, again, uh, hunker down, get through, I think, what'll be a couple difficult fiscal years and still do what we need to do for a growing city. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, I think we have a few questions that have come in uh, through, some, through, through some of our viewers, and let's, let's hear one or two of those. All right. Okay, how does the city determine where money is put for street repairs, sidewalks, and street lighting? Okay. You wanna take that one? I'll take that one. Um, so this is for sidewalks, street lighting, and street repair. Yeah, and, and, just, and just a little context on this. 
One of the more common questions that I receive when I'm knocking on doors is, hey man, when is my street going to get fixed? Great, right? great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how would, how, would, how would you answer that one? So th those programs are funded out of transportation and public works. And a number of years ago, this is within the last five years, uh, we created part of the tax rate. We call it pay as you go. It's essentially our cash commitment to maintaining infrastructure. And so we set aside six and a half cents of the property tax rate for a lot of these maintenance efforts. Um, so sidewalks, street lights, and street repairs would partly come out of that, yeah. that uh, dedication of the property tax. We have increased that over the last four to five years. We kept it at the same rate for next year's recommended budget. So that amount of money also grows each year. The uh, Transportation Public Works Department has a list of priorities of all the road needs. In fact, they grade the streets. I think it's uh, every three years all the streets get rated in Fort Worth. And they're graded, I think, A through F, right? And so as we work on the ones that are on the lower end, Ds and Fs, Cs, Ds and Fs, we know which streets those are and we know what cycle they are to be fixed. So if uh, citizens have a question about where is my street, we can tell you what it was mostly recently rated as and when it might be on a list to get rehabbed one way or the other. Sidewalks, there'll be a list of priorities on sidewalks and on street lights, the same thing. Uh, we try, we've now inventoried all <laughs> our street lights, we've inventoried all our sidewalks. Uh, we're trying to figure out the, all the conditions they're in and again, so we will be addressing the needs of street lights, sidewalks, roads based on the conditions that they're in. Well, and is it, is it the case then that the, the streets, for example, that are the worst rated, let's call them the Fs, are the top of the list in terms of which street is getting They should be on a list right now yeah. on a contract but getting rehabbed right now. Okay, so yeah. they're, they're, that's what I tell, I say, hey, yeah. they get graded and the worst ones are on the top of the list. That's how we do it in Fort Worth. Yes. Right. I think that's a good way to do it. Thank you. All right, let's hear another question or two. Why does so much time and attention go to the Las Vegas Trails area? Aren't there other parts of District 3 that also need extra assistance? Yeah, I can take that one. I, I think that's a legitimate question. I think that the Las Vegas Trail area gets a lot of attention, particularly in the press and the media, because there's a lot going on over there. You have the first ever community center, you have the first ever Boys and Girls Club. Uh, you have crime that's dropped double digits, uh, and yet it's still on the west side of Fort Worth, not just District 3, but on the west side of Fort Worth, no other area has still more crime, more poverty, more unemployment uh, than the Las Vegas Trail, and nothing's even close. Uh, and it's sort of like, you know, the sick patient gets the doctor, if you will, that re requires our attention. And yet there are other we, places in District 3 where we work very, very hard. I'll just run through a, a, a few of those. Over in West Cliff or West Cliff West area, we work very hard on the problem of the West Cliff Shopping Center, which is struggling and has had some potential buyers, but we have to make sure that doesn't turn into some more uh, stealth dorms, uh, that sort of thing, because stealth dorms in the West Cliff area are a real problem. In the Overton Woods area, uh, we've done a lot of work on a potential flooding issue there, and are the stop signs working or not for controlling speeding in the Tanglewood area. We have lots of speeding on Hartwood and we're working on some uh, driver feedback machines there. Uh, in Ridgely North, there's an issue of lighting and so we're working through the lighting problem. I can go on and on and on, but each one of our neighborhoods uh, gets a lot of attention from both me and from Michael Crane, who's the district director. And what I always say about Michael, you can count on this, pretty much anything good that comes out of my office is because of Michael Crane, because he is always on it and gets things done uh, very quickly and very efficiently and he always responds to people. Uh, so I, well, that's how I'd answer that question. David, anything else you would add to that? No, I think uh, the way you answer it is also similar to how other council members would talk about right their district. There are some areas and districts that are in real need and yet that Council member has to address the needs of the entire district. So, very yeah. well said. Yeah. Very well said. Okay. Well, I think, David, that that's all the questions for you, if I'm not I'm mistaken. I'm good with that. <laughs> You're good with that. I'm good with that. 
David, thank you very much for being on today. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. It's right. a pleasure. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. Our next guest is Chief Ed Krause, the Fort Worth Police Chief, and uh, he's taking a seat next to me here. Um, I've had the honor of working with uh, Chief Krause uh, through some very difficult times here, not just in Fort Worth, but the entire country. And uh, so I've asked uh, Chief just to talk a little bit about uh, the budget, but then we're also going to get into some of the issues that have, have come up for us uh, that you know, a lot of people are talking about. Um, so Chief, uh, the first question is about the budget, but listen, man, when, when people talk about you, you are one of the most beloved human beings in this city, and I can tell you that, <laughs> if not the most beloved, I, I, I think some, somebody referred to you as the fifth Beatle the other day, that sort of thing, so uh, way to go, man. But I think it's well-deserved. Before we get into a lot of things, uh, can we talk a little bit about the police budget, and if you could just highlight uh, what's coming up, what changes are you recommending that we, we do this year? Sure, Councilman Bird. I, I appreciate that opportunity. I've, I've been giving a presentation about the CCPD budget for several weeks now and some of the changes that we've uh, recommended to the uh, city manager's office and the council uh, to consider as they go through the budget process. Um, I talk a lot about the CCPD because that is an area where we have flexibility. Uh, the general fund, uh, most of what is in there is tied to personnel costs, salaries and benefits. So where you see an increase in the general fund, it is typically tied to uh, a meet and confer, which is the contract we have, the city has with the uh, police officers in the city. And if they get contractual raise or a step raise, that those dollars are figured into uh, the general fund because that's where most of our personnel are. And so if you see an increase in the general fund, it's typically tied to those. But the CCPD is where we have a little bit more, like I said, flexibility. Um, so the, uh, the citizens of Fort Worth that came out to vote for the CCPD election in July uh, voted for that CCPD, the Crime Control and Prevention District, to continue for 10 years. Um, that doesn't mean we have a budget that's going to be set for 10 years. Every year, uh, police department staff will come forward to the city manager's office and the council and say, this is how we're proposing to spend these projected revenues for the next year. So every year, we'll be able to tweak what we've done and based on input from the community and input from city leaders and, and where we need to place that money. This year, um, with all the public discourse locally and nationally, we saw some opportunities to do things a little bit differently. Um, so one of those things is as we came up to that CCPD election, we saw there was a lot of confusion about what Crime Control and Prevention District actually pays for. And as we started looking at the budget, we recognized why. Um, there are people in the police department, uh, including police leadership, that wasn't sure why this particular item or that particular item was funded by the Crime Control and Prevention District. And as we looked through that, we thought, if we don't completely understand it, how is the public supposed to understand sure. it? Yeah. So um, I'm just going to give you an example. Okay, so uh, back right around 2010, uh, the department decided we needed to increase the SWAT team based on the size of the city, the growth we've had, and best practices uh, dealing with the size of the SWAT team in other similarly sized cities. Well, in order to fund that at the time, the extra money was in the CCPD. So we created an expanded SWAT program and added eight officers in CCPD. But the other 20 officers were housed in the general fund. That's where their, their um, funding came for. But instead of moving that over to the general fund at the next budget year, it just remained in CCPD. So now you have two different funding sources funding the same Sure. component of the police department and that doesn't make any sense um, so this year we said let's clean up some of that stuff let's make it easier more transparent and easier to understand what's being funded by which account so we took those eight officers out of the CCPD put them in the general fund we didn't cut the SWAT team by eight officers we simply put them all in one general fund so they the SWAT team same number of officers um, just a clearly defined in which fund is going to pay for them. And then we looked at the general fund should fund as many traditional services as, as we can put in there. So we took other units such as the SRT, special response team, the criminal tracking unit, and we moved them into 
the general fund. Those are more traditional policing services. We took some of our uh, other units, like our bike patrol from West 7th Street um, and uh, downtown and move those into the general fund. So we swapped some units around to make it clear what fund mm -hmm. um, funded which group of officers and put them where we thought it made more sense. So that was one of the changes we made with CCPD. Another thing we did was increase funding for certain programs. Uh, we have a crisis intervention team mm -hmm. and it's based on a co-responder model where we place a, an officer with uh, extra training and mental health peace officer um, dealing with people in mental crisis and we team that individual with a mental health crisis worker from MHMR of Tarrant County and they respond to calls for service together. That way we have a mental health professional and a police officer on the call when they respond. And in addition to that, they do follow-up visits with people that we know have mental health issues um, and to make sure that they don't uh, devolve back into crisis. So that can be making sure they have access to the meds or access to a physician. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to do that a couple years ago. Um, we got a lot of accolades. They got a state award. Uh, they've been doing a good job, but there was only six of them doing the job. Mm -hmm. And so we were only able to do one shift Monday through Friday. Um, uh, part of the uh, panel of police experts that came and, and looked at our department policies, procedures, training, and processes said, that's great, you need to do more, and we agree. Um, so we've decided to expand that team. We have two teams of eight instead of one team of six, and that's gonna allow us to do crisis, have a crisis intervention um, response on two shifts seven days a week instead of one shift five days a week. So again, there's still room to expand more, but that's, that's a step in the right direction with this budget. Um, we're also implementing a, a new program where we have a lot of calls that, that we send officers to that don't necessarily need a police officer responding to them. Um, this is one of the great ideas we had out in the community. Um, we said, let's, let's go ahead and give that a shot. Let's try that. So we're uh, proposing hiring 10 employees that will go out into the community and answer those non-emergency, non-violent calls in the community um, to save our police officers to respond to more emergency situations. So we believe we'll be able to take a, a large amount of calls off the police officers. They'll be uh, responded to by this new team after they're trained, uh, hired and trained. Um, and that they'll be able to answer those calls. So those calls that typically hold in the queue for a long amount of time because they're lower priority will be answered in a quicker mm -hmm. fashion. Additionally, the priority one and two calls will be answered quicker because the officers won't be stuck on a mm -hmm. priority three or four report call. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a program we're going to start up, um, again, proposed in this, in this year's budget. And if it's successful, it's something that we'll look to expand in future years' CCPD budgets. I, I think these are all fantastic ideas. Uh, the mental health piece is something that people are really interested in unique solutions for. One of the things we've seen in healthcare when it comes to mental health, uh, for example, is medication noncompliance. You know, and how do we solve that? And I know there's, there's lots of discussion going on right now, whether it's through Peter Smith or MHMR, through you guys. But, but one of the things I've heard you say before, which I think is spot on, is that we're asking our police officers to just do too much. Uh, and uh, your team is available 24-7, 365, and as the backstop for pretty much everything, whether it's a, a loose dog when, when no one else is available or uh, all the kinds of things that you want a police officer there for, and then a bunch of things that, okay, we really don't need a trained sworn officer with a badge, with a gun uh, to respond to that. Uh, these ideas, I can tell you, are resonating with people as I'm talking to them. Um, and, and one of the questions that people have is, uh, how do you keep folks safe on the, 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 the team that uh, won't have a police officer with them, right? Uh, you know, how do you make sure they're going to be okay when they're going out when sometimes you've had a police officer do that? So that's a fair question. It's something we consider deeply because we don't want to put someone in, in a situation that get them hurt or killed uh, because we didn't think this through. Um, but as we look at this, we look at our code compliance officers, our animal control officers that go out to these non-emergency calls quite a bit because it deals with their specialty. Um, and 
you know, they don't have a police officer, they don't have a, a gun on their hip when they go out to those calls um, or the specialized training of a police officer. So what we've looked at, a very specific set of calls that can be handled by that group. Calls like uh, welfare checks, you know, would you check on my neighbor? Um, uh, calls like, uh, I've had a minor accident, and, and we don't want to send this group out on the freeways where it's a lot more dangerous, but if it's a side street accident and all we need is somebody to go out there and tell them how to exchange information and, and guide them in that process, that's definitely something we can send an officer to as long as there's no confrontation going on. Um, on it, so after a weekend, we'll have business owners go to their business and occasionally they'll find that it's been broken into. Yeah. Sometime over the weekend, their business was broken into. They don't need a police officer to go out there to take that report for something that you know happened over the past couple days. There's no threat, uh, ongoing threat there, so we can safely send somebody else there who's trained to take that report, trained to look for signs of evidence and collect that evidence if they need to. Um, so we've looked at which calls are conducive to this kind of program. We've also researched with other cities. We've looked at Denver's policy. North Richland Hills has been doing this for a while. And so we're taking what other people have learned and bringing that in. And then we understand there's a training component for our call takers. The people yeah. are answering the, the 911 calls and non-emergency calls. And they just, if we guide them and the correct answer or questions to ask, based on those answers, we'll be able to determine, is this something that requires a police officer or is this something one of our new civilian uh, employees can yeah, answer? Right, yeah. I, I would imagine that the person taking the call would need the right kind of training on, on these sorts of things to make sure they send the right person on this. Absolutely. Um, shift gears just a little bit. Thanks yeah. for the, all that, by the way. I think we're heading in the right direction there. And, and, and I think we're, we're, we're responding, uh, I think, in the the right way to the national discussion right now on policing. Um, uh, I want to talk about a moment that uh, just made me so proud. Uh, here in Fort Worth, we had a lot of just uh, folks demonstrating after the George Floyd uh, murder in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the moment that, that uh, you kneeled and uh, really brought some, uh, what I thought was um, a, a, a wonderful moment, not just for our city, but for our state, for our country. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the questions I think that a lot of people had was, what, le what led up to that? What made Chief Krause uh, uh, take that knee at that moment? So... I, I never want to make anything about me or, or my actions, um, but what, what we saw out there was a confrontation that was amping up. And, and when I say what we saw out there, we were at the Joint Operations, Emergency Operations Center watching on camera what was unfolding. And instead of having things ramp up, I thought if we went out there and, and let's, let's engage in a conversation, I think my officer seeing me out there may help calm the situation on that side. Maybe the, uh, the citizens seeing me out there will help calm things out there. Um, so we just went out there and started talking to individuals in the crowd. Um, and some were very emotional, very angry, understandable. Sure. They just wanted somebody to listen. I'm happy to be that person to listen. Um, I, I'm a person led by my faith. Um, uh, Assistant Chief Julie Swearingen was also with me, uh, went into the crowd with me. She is also a, a woman of faith and a tremendous uh, police leader. Uh, and, and as we talked to these individuals, we, we just got a sense that there was a, a way to connect there. And so Julie had said, hey, you know, what we need is prayer. Would, would you be willing to pray with us? And when several people in the crowd said they would like to pray with us, I said, this is great. Let's take a knee. Mm -hmm. It's been said we're never more like Christ than when we serve others. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said before, <clears throat> we're never more like each other than when we Work, bow down and, and humbly yeah. worship our Savior because how, how can you look at the person kneeling next to you on your left or right and think yeah. you're any better than that's they true. are? Um, so that's, that's what leads me. That, that's what led to that, that uh, instance happening. Yeah, thanks for talking about that. I, uh, that moment was captured in a, in a photograph that went around the world uh, and uh, something you said just now uh, about it was something I've, never, I've not heard you say about uh, that particular moment. Uh, to have one of our community's major leaders kneeling right beside everybody else who was out there. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. 
We're all uh, human beings who deserve uh, uh, the dignity required of just being a human being created in the image of God and therefore valuable. Um, and uh, I think that was a, a tremendous statement of leadership that uh, you were able to provide at the right time. Also, Assistant Chief Swearinger was able to do that. Appreciate you both on that. On this vein, and, and last question I have for you, uh, uh, just as this national discussion has been going on, uh, you know, you're the chief of the police force in the 13th largest city in the country. Uh, people look to you and they want to know, uh, what are you thinking about this? Where's your heart on this? Where, uh, you know, what has your thinking and reading and writing, your discussions with other police chiefs uh, been and taken you uh, to, to this moment right now? Well, and that's fair. And um, I, will, I will tell you, this, this deal with George Floyd, his, uh, his murder, it, it impacted the profession. Like, I've never seen anything impact the profession before. What we saw was uh, pretty quickly, even before a lot of the protests started, police officers na or police chiefs nationally getting on their social media to condemn that act. And that is something you didn't see widespread prior to this. Uh, police chiefs from one agency coming in and openly criticizing officers for their actions in another agency. Yeah. Um, it, it may have been a one-off here and there, but, but as a profession, you didn't see that. And then you saw police chief after police chief getting on there saying, this is wrong, enough's enough. We got to step in and, and stop this. And then the major city chiefs association um, uh, had it held an emergency conference call and they came out and said we have to say something as an organization that this has got to stop this this is not right we have got to be better and so uh, to my knowledge everyone in that organization agreed that yes this is something we want to put out and put uh, signature to paper on condemning that act um, and that that just spiraled I mean this the protests have continued in, in some yeah. cities even to up to today uh, but what you're seeing is a, a groundswell in policing for change that we have not encountered before. And if you can look at the changes happening across the country, and I'll be on some of it, maybe knee-jerk change um, and, and maybe not well thought out, um, but people recognize there's a need to change and they're acting on that. Um, I would hope that time and care is used in making sure we're getting the right change. Yeah change that we can sustain and change that can last and actually change the profession for the better. Yeah, uh, I, I think so too. And we want to make sure it's well thought out. We want to make sure we're listening to the people uh, that are demonstrating. We want to make sure we're protecting their right to demonstrate peaceably, which I think our city has done a great job uh, in doing that. Uh, particularly the group led by Donnell Ballard, I think has done a fantastic job uh, demonstrating here uh, one of our most important freedoms is the right to gather. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I know that you will, I know that I will, will always protect a person's right to do that here in the city of Fort Worth uh, if they're doing it in a peaceable manner. Uh, Chief, thank you for that. And I, we might have a question or two for you uh, from the audience. We do. Um, Chief, you did touch on this partly, but I thought you might want to expand on it. Um, we've heard quite a bit about the changes to the CCPD budget, but we haven't heard much about the police budget and the general fund. That police budget is increasing by about $5 million. Can you please tell us where the budget increase is coming from and where we can find those line items? Yeah, so again, I, as I said earlier, the general fund is pretty well set with personnel costs, and that's where most of that is, salaries and benefits for the officers that are housed in the general fund. Uh, we did not see any increases to the training budgets or the operating expenses for the different units. Most of that is tied into personnel costs. Has there been any pressure in Fort Worth to reduce police funding? No. Um, the The... The issue in Fort Worth was whether or not to renew the Crime Control and Prevention District. Um, there was um, several groups calling uh, to, for people to go out and vote against that. Um, you know, we had a very low voter turnout, as we do um, with those elections. Um, of the people that voted, 65 percent voted to continue that election. Uh, what is to note is we had more people come out to vote against that than we ever have in any other election. 
And, and I think that's important uh, that even though the majority said we support continuing this election, there's a larger number than ever before coming out and saying we don't support this election. So I think that's something we have to keep in mind as we move forward with each of these budgets that we put forward each year to make sure we're getting community input and make sure we're doing things the right way. And Yeah, the, that 35 percent that voted against CCPD are still citizens of Fort Worth and you and I are duty bound to serve them, to listen to them, and I want them to make sure if they're watching this that just because their vote uh, went against it and it passed that they still count. We're still listening to them. They still matter uh, to this discussion going forward. Well, they and, and the other, other side course, as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that balancing act. Um, but one of the things I have not had is any pressure from any city leader to try and politicize the police department. And I appreciate that beyond what any, <laughs> any of you city leaders could understand. Um, for us to be allowed to listen to the input, make strategic decisions with finances and budgeting and personnel allocations that we think are in the best interest, we the police department think are in the best interest of the city, um, it's, that, that, is, that in itself is a kind of support that any police chief would love to have. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. I have Any one others? More. Um, Chief Krauss, what are we doing to systemically change the Fort Worth police force so tragedies do not occur here in our city? So we have implemented a, a lot of policy. Most recently, our use of force policy was updated at the end of uh, July. Um, what we found out from the police reform expert panel um, is that we have pretty strong policies in the Fort Worth Police Department. What we are lacking is in translating that uh, policy to highly effective training and also the accountability piece on the back end. So in this change to the use of force policy, for instance, um, we have a requirement for an officer who uses force to also now put in the report what de-escalation attempts they used or attempted to use. Um, so we've had a great de-escalation policy for the past couple of years, but what was pointed out to us was, where's the accountability piece when de-escalation isn't used? Right. And so we put that piece in there, and then we also put, as that use of force report gets forwarded up the chain of command, each level of command has to go through there and look to see was that de-escalation used? Was de-escalation attempted? We have to make it part of the ingrained nature of not only our officers, but the supervisors throughout the organization that that is an essential component. So we're doing that with several different things. De-escalation's one, um, you know, the eight can't wait uh, uh, organization, they, they uh, <coughs> graded us as having six of the uh, eight policies. Um, in effect, and we have had several of them in effect for, for quite some time, many, many years, um, but there were two that they said were lacking on. So we've changed those with the use of force uh, policy revision, and I, and I got to say, I know you have her on the show coming up, but Kimberly Neal, the, uh, the police monitor, has been fantastic since she showed up here. And a lot of the stuff that the expert panel um, has pointed out Kim and Denise pointed out before that, mm -hmm. and we had already started changing it, so it made that transition very easy. Um, but so those last two eight, uh, eight can't wait policies, uh, we've already submitted them to the eight can't wait organization. And said, hey, we're, we've now got this in our policy. We'd like for you to go ahead and look at it and, and you know mark off that we got all eight. So we're waiting on that. Uh, uh, Chief, I, I think all that is fantastic. And, um, I'll get to interview Kim here in just a minute and talk about how we human beings just do better uh, when there are good accountability systems. That's me, that's you, that's everybody. Um, and so thank you for addressing that uh, right now. I'll tell you, I appreciate every one of our police officers so much. Uh, Alan Pennington, who's the NPO over in Ridgely Hills, there's not a finer human being in the whole world. Same with Bel Haddad in Ridgely North. Uh, and Officer Grinnells and Officer Carpenter in the Las Vegas Trail area. I could go on and on and on. And these human beings literally risk their lives every day so that my family, all of our families, can have safety uh, here in Fort Worth in the city that we love so much. Uh, thank you very much for providing that for us, Chief. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Appreciate it, Dr. Bird. Okay, thank you.
All right. Okay, our next guest, so to speak, this is a little bit like the Carson Show, I suppose. Although we could have some music in the background and make it a little bit better, but that's all right. Uh, the, the next person is Kimberly Neal. I'm really excited about uh, talking with Kimberly. Uh, she's new, so we're going to ask her to talk a little bit about uh, where she's from and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we'll get into kind of discussing what is the Office of uh, Police Monitor. And so, uh, Kim, welcome. Thank you. And uh, since you are new, I think you've only been here since March. Can you just tell folks who are watching a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I have spent most of my career in the government field, um, whether it be federal, state, or local government in the ethics and compliance field, um, in policy procedures, and um, doing some oversight in a lot of fields um, in the government as a whole. <clears throat> recently, I've been with Fort Worth for six months, and recently I came from Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was the director of a civilian oversight agency there over the Cincinnati Police Department. And so I spent five years there, uh, and it was, uh, uh, we had a different type of civilian oversight of uh, policing. Uh, we actually had an investigative model where we actually did separate investigations in addition to the police department's investigations, as well as the role of the police monitor as well. So it was a more um, involved role. Um, however, it required a lot. It's one of your more expensive roles of civilian oversight. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the police monitor role itself is one that is a much more sustainable role because you can really do some systemic changes and make some systemic changes within the police department that you're working for. So I'm happy to be here in Fort Worth. Good. Thank you. We're, we're delighted uh, that you're here. Uh, it's been an interesting first six or so months for you, hasn't it? Cause, hasn't it? Because you got here in March, uh, and then almost immediately the COVID quarantine hit everything. Absolutely. Uh, and that sort of interrupted your ability to uh, do what pretty much anybody does when they first arrive somewhere, is to really get to know uh, the people that we're serving. Yes. Uh, and then uh, we had a George Floyd uh, incident, mm -hmm. uh, which was just so horrible, yes. uh, and it ignited a discussion uh, about policing uh, all over our city, and our own city has wrestled uh, with this in the past. With, yes. uh, and, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons why we decided to create your position was mm -hmm. because of December of 2016 with uh, Ms. Jacqueline Craig and what yes. happened there. And then in October of last year, just a tragic event that we're all grieved about so much with the Tatiana Jefferson, Absolutely. and a young woman lost her life. Um, uh, and, and, and it also is, in, in the way that I see it, is uh, good timing for you uh, to come on the scene and, and help us think through this and work through this, as we're all locked arms, uh, wanting to work through it together, and I think we all have the same goals in mind. Um, I believe in the police monitor position. I was a proponent of it as soon as I uh, heard about it and studied it. Can you talk a little bit about what is a police monitor? Who do you report to? Why does it work? And what are some of your goals and mission as you work along this? So the police monitor role is one in which we monitor the police department, monitor the investigations, monitor policies and procedures and the changes to those policies and procedures make recommendations to the police department as it relates to its investigations of police officers as well as its policies and procedures. And then also look at training, look at recruitment, um, and all aspects of the policing that we can help make our police department the most effective, accountable police department to the citizens. And so the monitor's role is important and the, and the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor's role is important because we're working hand in hand with the community and with the police to ensure that all all voices are heard to ensure that uh, policing is in fact impartial and unbiased um, and to ensure that policing overall in the city of Fort Worth is transparent. And so um, in that time, in the six months that we've been here, even though we've kind of been confined due to COVID, we've met, um, I would say, hundreds of stakeholders across the city of Fort Worth virtually. Initially, we started out meeting face to face. Um, but of course, I went to virtual real quick within my second week of being here. And that has been an enlightening experience because we've learned so much from the city leaders. We've learned so much from the community across the city of Fort Worth. 
um, the diversity uh, in the responses and the the input that we get from the communities is is just so great and mm -hmm. to hear all the great things that are being done in, in the communities as well as when there are certain eight certain stakeholders that are working directly hand in hand with police and um, are really moving forward in improving on police and community relations has been really a really a learnable experience for our office. Um, I report directly to uh, uh, David, uh, our city manager, and um, and our office is actually within the city manager's office. We have a little corner in the city manager's office, and we have uh, really, in a short time, we have, of course, our deputy monitor, uh, Denise Rodriguez. We have an office manager, Vanessa Campos, and we hope to be hiring a couple of other individuals. Uh, pretty soon, as well as bringing in some interns from the law, local law school here downtown hmm. um, pretty soon as well. So we are really moving forward to really impact some positive changes. And um, as a chief reference, we've been working hard, uh, collaborating with the police department on making changes to the use of force, mm -hmm. um, to uh, early intervention. Um, we are, um, in fact, attending trainings over at the police academy, both with the recruits, as well as the uh, in-service personnel to see exactly what type of training they're receiving. And, you know, the thing about making changes to policy and procedure uh, is great, but we have to see it full through, full, fully impacted and fully through the process. And so um, what's great is that we've made the changes, but we want to make sure that it trickles down to our personnel. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the duty to intervene that has been in the news lately is one that the police department has had. Um, due to report was also added to that particular procedure, but we were actually able to go over to to the academy and see the recruits actually employ that scenario um, where um, they actually played it out, where, you know, where an officer may have um, been a little bit too passionate about their encounter with the uh, citizen, and so um, other officers uh, knew it was their duty. They played it out, the scenario, and then had to report on exactly what their actions were. And that is something that really trickles down to how we police, mm -hmm. um, how the police police uh, or enforce the laws in, in the city of Fort Worth. So mm -hmm. it's been really great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love all of that. I yeah. love the accountability piece as that was just mentioning to Chief Krauss, we human beings, we need it. We just do better when the right accountability Absolutely. is in place, even though, uh, you know, I don't particularly like it when, I, <laughs> when I'm held accountable. None of us do, but we know it makes us better. Uh, and isn't that one of the reasons why it's important that you report to the city manager rather than within the police department. You talk about that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, you know, if you're going to have uh, what we call civilian oversight of police or law enforcement, um, then it would never work within the police department. So I have my counterparts across the country who do this, um, have been doing it um, just as long as I have and some longer. And uh, it's consistent across the country that working within a police department, um, you, you can never impact the change that you need to impact if you're working directly within the police department. Um, now, of course, if we had a chief like uh, Chief Kraus, then it may work. Um, the but fifth of course, Is that your, that's your, the fifth beetle. Okay, I was just checking. Yeah. But um, <laughs> of course, when they leave, then you know you have a different. Dy you could have a different dynamic, yeah. and so you want to make sure that the independence piece is so important to civilian oversight. And it's, and it's important because you want to make sure that no city official is interfering with the autonomy of the office mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, the police oversight monitor. And so that independence piece is ever so important. And if you're within the police department, then that piece wouldn't be considered in independent. Yeah. My last question for you goes like this. Uh, talk about what, what you would like your uh, sort of legacy to be, say, five years from now, looking back, what difference do you want to say, this is, what, this is the difference we got to make here in yeah. the city of Fort Worth? Um, to be frank, I would like people to say, uh, well, she actually knew what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so, you know, so because we, we're doing a lot of engagements, and, and I know that some members of the community are concerned yeah. that the engagements are kind of a feel-good, kind of a, uh, you know, a placeholder, kind of just um, uh, make, allowing us to drag things out, and it's really not the purpose of 
the community engagements. The community engagements are to, number one, collect information, but most importantly, it's to engage the community to make sure that co the community knows that their voices are heard mm -hmm. and that we are, uh, all of us, not just the police department, but my office and everyone else is accountable to, we are accountable to the citizens of Fort Worth. And so, you know, every time, you know, a, a group says to me, well, we represent a certain set of folks in the city of Fort Worth, then I'll have another meeting with someone that, say, that says that they, they don't represent me because I have a whole different set of issues. And so right. the community engagements are important for that reason alone. And then in addition to that, what we're doing in these upcoming community engagements that we're having starting next week um, is we're going to have both police and community members there. Mm -hmm. So we want to, you know, we want to kind of uh, Re, uh, redevelop the dialogue, if you will, um, between police and community to discuss some of the concerns that both citizens and, frankly, um, police officers have uh, been forthcoming with in the surveys that we completed in August. Yeah. Um, that piece has been um, very enlightening for, for my office. Um, the comments that were given and what's so intriguing about those surveys is that many of the issues that came out of those surveys were ones that the community had, but also police officers had it. Mm. They just worded it a different way. But at the end what's of the day... What's an example of that? Yeah. Well, an example is that, that uh, both police and community members want more engagement. Mm. They want to be able, they want to be a part of the problem-solving team. So mm -hmm. if they have concerns in their neighborhood, it's great that the police department is doing problem solving, but some community members feel like that they're not being engaged, that they feel like they live in the neighborhood every day and they want to be a part of that conversation. And so why not have a community engagement where you can bring people to the table in all of our six police divisions and talk yeah. about some of those issues? And so, um, so we hope to kind of just restart that dialogue. We know it's happening in some communities, but some communities feel like it's not happening in theirs. And so we want to give that opportunity to community members and police. And the police are saying the same thing. They want to be able to uh, reach out to the citizens more and do more community policing. And so the example that the chief gave as far as repurposing some of the money to create these civilian positions, that is absolutely wonderful yeah. because um, it allows police officers <clears throat> to not only um, uh, pay attention to the more priority calls, but it also uh, gives them, I think, the ability to do more community policing because we do, we that was heard um, very um, severely or, or seriously in those um, um, uh, surveys that the police, the, many police officers, our patrol officers want to do community policing. Mm. They want to be able to learn their communities and talk to their communities and talk to their community members and know who they are. And so I think doing those civilian positions will give them that opportunity. So I think that's a great, great idea. That's, that's certainly one of the principles that uh, we've heard you talk about and that we've heard Chief Krause talk about, yes. that the community policing, which includes preventative policing and getting to know an area, yeah. uh, isn't just within the domain of the neighborhood police yes. uh, patrol officer. Yes. Uh, it's for all of the patrol officers, uh, uh, whenever they're on duty, to be engaged in that manner. Absolutely, and that's exactly what the police officers were saying on the survey. Yeah. They love their MPOs, but they want they want to also do the same thing that the P MPOs are doing. That's good. So hopefully we can we can afford them that opportunity, at least some of them that opportunity to do that. Well, I, I, I love how you're you're using the general principle. If we want the right kind of change in an organization, then then go ask the people who are closest to right. uh, where where things are taking place, because they'll probably know what the right answers are and the right change that needs to take place. Yes. That's very good. Yes. Okay, I think we have a couple of questions okay. for you. Yes, you mentioned this, Kim, but could you maybe expand on what true independence looks like for an effective police oversight program? So I, I think that true independence looks like um, really it's pretty much what the chief said about uh, the police department, that you know there are no, no ones politicizing the process. No one's politicizing what we do. Um, no one is um, telling us what to do or how we should opine in a particular case or how we should opine in a, on a particular policy or procedure. That we are truly independent and unbiased. 
uh, and objective in how we handle each and every review of the police department, whether it be a complaint, whether it be a policy and procedure, whether it be training. And so that is true independence. Has the budget been updated to reflect the new positions that you need and will you be allowed to hire despite the hiring freeze? So yes, um, so the, the budget's been updated in the city manager's office to in, in fact increase two more positions within our office. And so um, is that everything that we'll need? We'll have to, we'll see, we'll assess the situation with the two new uh, uh, positions and then we'll, you know, uh, if we need more, then we'll definitely approach that um, doing budget season next year. Um, and as far as the uh, autonomy of the office, it will remain the same. Um, the office will continue to be in the city manager's office, I guess, until we're busting out the seams and they put us out the city manager's office. So we'll <laughs> see how that goes. Yeah. If, 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 by the way, Kim, uh, if somebody has a concern about uh, an interaction they had with one of our officers, how do they let you know about that? So they can call um, our office at 817-392-6535. Uh, um, they can also uh, uh, email us at Fort, um, I'm sorry, at, um, oh, I just forgot the email, uh, at uh, police oversight, uh, yes, at fortworthpoliceoversight.gov. And also they can actually go onto our website. And our website is, once they go into the city's website, we're yeah. one of the departments listed. But our acronym is OPOM. So if they just Google OPOM Fort Worth, then everything will come out. What is the extra O in there for? Um, Officer of Police, uh, Police Oversight the Monitor. Oversight. Yes. Okay. O P yes. O M. Yes. Don't worry, I'll get it down. Yes. As, just as quickly as possible. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Kim, certainly, uh, it, it's my opinion, I think most people's opinion, that the most important thing that we do as a municipal government is provide for the safety of uh, the citizenry, uh, the people that uh, pay our bills. And you're a big part of that now and thank you for that and thank you for what you're doing to make us better. Thank you, thank you. Okay, our, our, our final uh, guest uh, is walking up now is the fire chief Jim Davis and I've had the pleasure of working closely with Jim over the last two years and uh, I think he just flew in from Iceland or something like that. Or maybe close. it's not Iceland, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, uh, so uh, Jim and I work very closely together, uh, uh, of course, here at the city and also at MedStar, which provides ambulance service for the city of Fort Worth and 14 other cities here in Tarrant County. So Jim, you're, you're kind of new to Fort Worth. I say you're kind of new. You've been here two years. It's hard to believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, first of all, we're glad to have you. Thank you. First of all, tell us a little bit about uh, your background. Where'd you come from and how'd you get here? Sure thing. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me to be here with you tonight. I, uh, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I went, uh, went to school there. I went to college there. I got hired by the uh, fire department in the city of Columbus. I worked there for 30 years. Um, I went back to graduate school, got a degree, I went to nursing school. Uh, I spent about 20, 22 years as a critical care nurse, um, mm. all kinds of different settings, ER, ICU, flight nursing, those type of things. About two and a half, uh, <coughs> just, just, just shy of three years ago, uh, the city of Fort Worth asked if I'd be interested in coming out and taking a look around, and I did. Uh, came to town, uh, actually fell in love with the community, uh, almost about this time two years ago, I was moving into downtown and starting work and hitting the ground running and uh, working with a thousand people of both uniform and civilian within the Fort Worth Fire Department that uh, have have truly uh, uh, felt been blessed the, that that I've had the opportunity to work with them and be a part of uh, what uh, is now grown into the uh, 13th largest city in the United yeah. States. So yeah. it's great. Good. Well, we're we're delighted that you're here and you run a great department, uh, Chief. I know a lot of those folks and I know that you're uh, working with them. I know that you're working on some things there and one of the things that people are interested in is all the growth that we're having in That's Fort true. Worth. 15 to 20 thousand people moving here every year. Uh, in addition to that we have a lot of landmass for a city our size. That's a That's lot of coverage that we lean on you to provide coverage for if we get in a car accident, yeah. if something happens, if there's a fire. Um, in, in particular, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of three kind of focuses of growth in Fort Worth Alliance up north, 
south along Chisholm Trail. I mean, the other big one is west in District 3, uh, where Walsh is uh, exploding, and so are some other developments Absolutely. out there. How are you making sure that we stay ahead of that and take care of that? So it was actually one of the intriguing things about coming to work here. I sat down with Mr. Cook and the leadership team of Fort Worth. It was, it was a, a great opportunity to, to be a part of something that was continuing to grow, which presented a lot of opportunity, but yet a lot of challenges too. And so when you speak uh, specifically of Walsh, um, you know, you, you have to appreciate the fact that having I, where I came from was in a similar situation where it did not, it was not landlocked by other communities. And so when you start looking at that, those, those are great opportunities. And you have to really dig into the community. You have to find out what the community's plans are. You know, on, on your way to Walsh, you know, you've also got another development out there called Lost Creek that, you know, we, we really have met with, we've sat down with, we've got a lot of things that we're trying to work with there too. We've got property there for a fire station and we're actively working with the city to, to determine if that is um, really a, the best viable alternative for a fire station. The money's been appropriated, thankfully, in the bond levy by the taxpayers. And so we feel very confident that, uh, you know, we are going to be in a situation where we'll be providing services there um, in the next uh, year or so, have a fire station out there. Uh, we plan, uh, our hope is to break ground by the end of the year. Good. The station's been, uh, you know, architecturally designed, uh, and we're in the process now of just making sure that it's in the in the exact right spot it needs to be, considering all of the growth. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dickerson, Ryan Dickerson, is a new leader out there for the for the properties. They've got uh, some new growth um, anticipated plans. Uh, they've been meeting with the uh, other partners in the community, the other ranches out there, which are going to um, provide other opportunity and potentially other need for services. Um, as you know, as you've mentioned, there's a lot of freeway out there already, mm -hmm. and there's a, a lot of traffic pattern through that freeway with uh, hazardous materials and stuff that we do uh, still provide services to. So making sure that we're there is uh, part of it. Making sure that we're there with the right response uh, is uh, is our main focus. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. And and the, that Lost Creek. Uh, site for the fire station uh, really has been discussed a tremendous amount since I was elected three years ago. Yes, sir. And I know there have been some hiccups trying to get that done. A lot of stuff I don't really understand. I'm not a real estate guy, but something about water or sewer. Uh, so I'm glad to hear you say that by the end of this year, maybe December, we should be breaking ground we're, on we're, that. That's the anticipation provided that we can get uh, the issues resolved on that particular property. And if uh, we have to uh, look at other options. Um, we've we've been meeting with the city to make sure that we are strategically looking at placing that fire station in the best location possible to provide a timely service to the residents and guests of that area yeah. with the future development plans. Um, we believe that um, that the site um, it's possible to get there, um, and we're uh, still working with the city and uh, community partners to get there. Yeah, very good. Talk a little bit about uh, MedStar and the way that the fire department partners with MedStar to make sure that we uh, get not only just somebody on scene, but even before we have somebody on scene, we're helping people provide care. Yeah, that's actually a great point. You know, we, we, we have an elaborate 911 system here. Uh, the fire department and the police department provide emergency response, obviously, from a police and fire perspective, but what the public doesn't always understand is that police and fire also provide a, a good deal of medical care to our community. Uh, MedStar is uh, a authority, it's a governmental authority by code, by statute, and they are the uh, uh, ambulance provider and 911 EMS provider for our community and as you mentioned, 14 other communities in the area. Um, and we work collaboratively with them on a day in and day out basis to do several things. One, make sure timely responses to the community for their need um, specific to the type of call it is based on um, whether or not it's a basic life support call or a more advanced life support call where somebody might possibly be critically ill or injured. We make sure that uh, between the police 911 dispatchers, the fire department dispatchers, the MedStar uh, 911 dispatchers, that the highest level of, uh, of illness and injury, that folks, what we, what we like to talk about is a zero minute response time. We leave people on the phone with them, um, the entire uh, response, it might be a three, four, five minute response, but we make sure that there's somebody on the phone with them giving them pre-arrival instructions. And we do that purposely to make sure that people 
are taught over the phone to take care of the emergency themselves until our help arrives in the form of either MedStar, fire, or police. And so from there then, what, what ends up happening is that the fire department, um, you know, everybody thinks of the word fire. They think that we're, we're, we are an all-hazard agency, that we're, we have 130 paramedics on our fire department. We provide a high level of care under the same medical direction and the same protocol of MedStar and the police department. And what we do is we make sure that we have a unified approach in the uh, best interest of the community when it comes to that care and that we ride to the hospital with them when necessary. We make sure that we're there ahead of them if they're coming from a different area of town and we have a fire station that's strategically placed in a community. And if they get there and they need help, they know all they got to do is ask for it and we're there to support them and help them. It's a big deal to have you and your team available 24-7, 365 scattered in stations all over the city so that we can get to people when they need it. Because uh, if I'm a citizen and I call 911, doggone it, I expect somebody to be there uh, and take care of us. Um, the zero minute response I think is fantastic because there's a lot of first aid care that a normal person can provide. Uh, and so is it the case then that the dispatcher or whoever that person calls and gets a hold of is kind of walking them through how to stop the bleeding, how exactly. to do CPR, these sorts exactly. of things? Exactly. That's yeah. exactly it. You know, these protocols are developed through um, a lot of uh, medical direction, a lot of uh, research-based uh, uh, science that talks about um, what and, and how you interact and talk to people when they are stressed. Um, the things to say, the manner to say it, to get their attention in order for them to concentrate, to do what you're asking them to do at the same time that we're trying to get them help by finding out where they're at and a phone number to call them back if we get disconnected. You know, the biggest thing that a 911 dispatcher needs to know is where are you at? Where is help needed, right? right? Yeah. Everything else is secondary to where are you? And once we get that, then we figure out what the problem is. If they're not awake, then are, are they breathing? If they're not breathing, do they have a pulse? Do we need to start CPR? That is probably one of the highest uh, medical issues we have. You know, from a fire side, you know, it's where's the fire? Are you trapped? Where in the house are you trapped? Can you get out? Those type of things. So we don't leave people alone during those times. We make sure that we're talking them down from their stress and we're concentrating on trying to get help started. And we're very, um, we've got a really a professional group of people in all three, in all three groups and they do a great job getting people um, to concentrate on providing a, uh, a level of care um, at what is a very basic level for the most part. Getting CPR started, getting bleeding stopped as you talk about, and making sure that people that are, need to be moved because they're in a dangerous position are moved and those that aren't, aren't moved. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you've, you've kind of hit it on the head there. Yeah. yeah, a lot of medicine is knowing what not to do. That's true. A, a lot of times, yes, sir. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I think your medical background, I think, is so important in this and so helpful in this. Um, I think your partnership with uh, the different agencies is huge. We have tremendous leadership from Dr. Veer Bithalani, uh, who's the medical director over these systems, and um, your team, the, uh, the, the, the police department, and all the wonderful folks at MedStar. Um, my last question for you uh, is about Text 911. Oh, very good. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, what's coming in regards to Text 911? So the uh, Tarrant County 911 board, which oversees the, uh, the 911 uh, communication system for the county, is on, in a project um, that we were hoping to have done here by the end of August, but with the uh, COVID stuff, we've kind of hit some delays in being able to get into 911 centers. But across the country, the, the next phase of 911 is going to be a text to 911 system. And that is, um, a benefit to people who are in a situation where actually making a phone call to a 911 dispatcher potentially puts them at risk. Yeah. You know, a lot of those situations are police emergencies, to be honest with you. Um, and so with that, um, there's an opportunity now in Tarrant County that been supported by the mayor, by council as yourself, by the city manager's office to make sure that we have that next generation capability where people can text their location to 911, they get a response back from the dispatcher, making sure that they um, have communicated that yes, we got your text and it's not off out in the cyberland somewhere. That was one of the biggest uh, 
things that we found um, from the Virginia Tech school shooting is that kids were hunkered down in classrooms texting right. and it was going to nowhere. So making sure mm -hmm. that there's a response to that is a big educational part of this. And then making sure we have the system set up in a way that we can give those pre-arrival instructions that are so important that we just talked about. Yeah, well, and I think you're making a good point. We'll have our work cut out for us once the system is in place yes. and making sure everybody knows that it's available for them to use if they are in a situation uh, like, like you've described. Okay, yep. great. Well, we have a couple of questions, okay. I think. Okay. Do we partner with neighboring cities like Benbrook and Alito to get assistance on coverage? So that's a great question, and, and yes, we absolutely do. There's two different forms of assistance and coverage, and we give and we get. One is mutual aid, and one is automatic response. So what's the difference in the two? Automatic response is a program that's set up um, in which we um, work with our neighboring partners to make sure that the closest emergency vehicle goes to that scene of the emergency to make sure that there's no delay in care and that we are working collaboratively as communities to support our residents but also make sure that they have help in a timely fashion. So mutual aid on, another, on the other side is a much more elaborate system where the city of Fort Worth is an example has a responsibility um, to provide mutual assistance to uh, other municipalities because there are certain things that we get federal funding for, such as our explosive ordnance uh, unit, our bomb squad, such as our hazmat team. We get federal money for that to make sure that they are mission ready here in the Fort Worth area. And because of that, we as the city also commit that we will make those resources available to a region from a regional approach. Yeah. And so, yes, we do. We work on that. There's a, um, there's a collaboration of uh, the fire chiefs of all these cities that represent uh, at uh, meetings to make sure that we're having good communication and that we are working collaboratively together in the best interest of the public. And we, we, we do a pretty good job of that here. There's, there's good interaction and good communication. Yeah, we're, we're all better working together been working in silos yeah. for sure. We appreciate that. I appreciate it. How has the fire department been involved in the COVID-19 response, in particular testing? Wow. So that's a, uh, <laughs> that's a big question. I, and, you know, I appreciate you asking that question. One of the goals I've had since I've been here, I believe that there's um, a good opportunity in major cities across the United States to tie public safety and public health more collaboratively uh -huh. together. There's, there's a lot of overlap that if we work together and we just have good communication, we can figure out ways to help. And as an example, one of them is uh, through testing. Uh, very early on in the uh, uh, COVID response, um, I think we would all agree that, that the volume of testing was not where it needed to be. And so we made sure that, you know, we had the support from the city leadership. And what we did is we turned around and, and the, the Fort Worth Fire Department's in a unique position because we have the skills with our healthcare experience and our hazardous material experience, our, our ability to go to significantly um, challenging runs where there's the potential for illness and protect ourselves. You know, we use that same mindset and hazardous material response. Using the tools and the equipment and the training, we were in a unique position to do this. And so we've, we've been out, we've done over 15,000 nursing uh, home uh, exams and tests in, of patients and staff in nursing 15, homes. We've done over 15,000 mm -hmm. at this point. Um, we're working in conjunction with uh, the uh, Tarrant County Public Health Department on mm -hmm. that. They assign a nursing home that has got uh, a, uh, case, uh, cases that they're concerned about, and we, we go out and um, we do the testing there. Uh, we've been working with um, uh, Sergeant Ed Bach and the Fort Worth Police Department, who have been absolutely knocking it out of the park in the community testing, um, along with um, the uh, folks from Tarrant County Public Health and Brandon Bennett and uh, Cody Montana. Uh, Whittingham from here in the for, uh, city of Fort Worth to do uh, community testing and get it out into each council member's district. We have testing available now. We've got good teams that are out there that are highly trained to do it and we can get it turned around in a uh, in anywhere between a 12 and a 36 hour window depending on what test we do. And so if people feel they need tested, we need to make sure that people know that the testing's available, it's accurate at this point, and we need them to get tested. 98% accurate, it I is, think, is that right? It is, yeah. and the testing company like you to like, like me to tell you it's 99% because they have a one to two, so I'll err on the side of cautiousness and say <laughs> 98%. I think that's better. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And um, our last question, it's not about um, the fire specifically, but more about the district in general. Um, you've talked about Las Vegas Trail. Can you tell us what you've done to help another economically depressed area in your district Lake Como. Sure. We spent a lot of time working with the Como leadership. We, uh, working with our planning department, put a plan together to take it to the regional transportation uh, COG and uh, apply for a grant so that we can streetscape Horn Street. Horn Street is the arterial that runs north and south right down the middle of Como, almost down the middle. It's, it's a little bit on the west side. We were successful uh, in obtaining that grant. I think it's in the seven million dollar range. The city's going to add another million to that. I think that project is going to roll out in 2023 range. And the other big thing, of course, that's happened in Como is we were able to break down and complete uh, the Como Community Center, which is right there on Horn. It looks fantastic uh, and uh, it, it, we just need to be able to use it more, right? But we've been uh, inhibited in doing that because of the COVID situation. Uh, but we, we've been able to use it for testing for COVID, uh, so we're putting it to use uh, the best that we can. I'm in close contact uh, with Ella Burton, uh, with, with Dorsey DeBose, and all kinds of folks in the Lake Como area uh, as things come up. Uh, I also appreciate very much Commander Cynthia O'Neill, who's the commander of the West Division of the City of Fort Worth Police Department. Uh, and uh, she and I work very closely uh, in uh, taking questions or concerns or, or reports, things like this. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, Chief, before you go, I, I'll tell you that, uh, first of all, we appreciate you and we appreciate all the folks that serve as firefighters in the city of Fort Worth. About two years ago, they invited me out to the Firefighter 101, uh, the where they take knuckleheads like me and put us through the paces. Uh, and uh, they taught us how to put on all the gear, and uh, they taught us that uh, somewhere in that process, um, firefighters face a significant increase in cancer. And we're That's seeing true. that, and we're trying to get that figured out. But, but our folks who are firefighters, they know that they're putting themselves at increased risk of cancer and a shortened life. We appreciate them uh, risking their lives for us. I also got just a little taste of how cha physically challenging that job is. Uh, and, the, you know, they put the hat on me and the tank, which I know only weighs like 40 pounds. It felt like 140. They made a, a fake fire, and, and I grabbed the hose. And fortunately, there was a real firefighter behind, behind me. You. Yeah. And uh, we went in, and I tell you, within 10 seconds, my heart was beating out of my chest. My legs felt like jelly. Uh, and that was only just literally a minute and a half. Uh, into the process and we appreciate these guys taking good care of themselves uh, so that they can take care of us. Uh, my parents uh, live down the street, uh, they live in Ridge Country Club States and they live down the street from one of our firehouses right there on 183 and for the last, I think it's 26 years now, no, no, it's longer than that. This is going back to 1985, what is that, 45 years, uh, 35. Uh, they have on uh, on Christmas Eve, they've taken food to the firefighters that are over there. Uh, and they always say, you know, they look at the map on the wall and they say, now my house is right here, don't forget about me. Uh, but, but they just do that as an expression of thanks. Uh, and uh, my cousin lives in, in California as a firefighter, nearing the end of his career uh, and battling, he, we've all heard about the terrible uh, forest fires over there and last year he lost a dear friend who'd been on the force with him for 20 plus years. Uh, it's a dangerous job whether you guys are fighting fires or you're out uh, on a freeway taking care of an accident and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you. Well I appreciate it and and I would like to just real quick I'd like to point out that you know I, I appreciate you mention, mentioning the cancer um, you know heart disease, cancer, um, behavioral health as far as uh, post-traumatic stress uh, our big issues, uh, it, it, the suicide rate in the fire service nationally is a problem that concerns me. Um, I've been here two years and I, I have to make sure that I thank you and I, th I thank the members of council, the members of the city manager's office because I, I really can look at the members of the Fort Worth Fire Department and the public and say that there has been effort put forward 
um, and support behind and financial support behind the health and the wellness of the Fort Worth firefighters. And we are making strides in that regard. And if I have one goal here as the fire chief in this city, it's to make sure that I give every one of them the opportunity to go home safe at the end of their shift. And But I can't do it without your support, your members of council support, city manager support. So but personally, I want to say thank you. Thanks for that, Chief. Appreciate you being here tonight, really yeah, do. Thank you. Well, that's all of our guests, and that's, uh, I think, all the questions that have come in. Thank you for tuning in for the District 3 uh, City Hall, and uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us, District 3, the number 3, at fortworthtexas.gov. Please make sure you wear your mask when you're out in public so we can keep this COVID thing uh, suppressed so that we can make sure our economy keeps coming back. And folks, it is coming back. Uh, let me say how much we appreciate everybody that was here tonight and also appreciate our wonderful mayor uh, who has been leading all of us through this. And a couple of folks have commented on the support that they received from city council and that, that we don't politicize things. Listen, a lot of that is because of the leadership that Mayor Betsy Price uh, has brought to this this organization in this city and we appreciate her very much. Thank you very much for turning for tuning in.